Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is brought to you by MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by the Wes Express, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. I hear of Sherlock everywhere. Episode 217, The Staunton Tragedy. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a stronger. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jacket officer. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Ah, uh, and what a time we are going to have today. Hello and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you feeling comic or tragic today? I'm feeling tragic comic. Tragic comic, comic tragic. Comic songs. Yeah. Comic songs? No, 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 that's Comic Con. I can't get into Comic Con. <laughs> Goodness because I don't gracious. Have well, you are a font of all wisdom as far as I'm concerned, and conventional or not, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, we will introduce our guests in this episode in just a moment, but before we do, a reminder that you can find the show notes for this episode, which includes all kinds of links and fun stuff and ways to support us and to review the show at ihose.co slash ihose217, all lowercase. That'll bring you directly to the ihearofsherlock.com website. There, in uh, just a few moments, if you give us a, a chance to get caught up, we will have the transcript to this episode, so you can follow along and read, uh, particularly for our listeners who are uh, hard of hearing or deaf, we do welcome that access for them. And that's made possible by our generous supporters, people who support us on Patreon or on PayPal. There are links to do each of those things for as little as a dollar a month to help support what we do here at I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. We appreciate your support and we look forward to inviting more people to enjoy I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere in the future. Well, we have an opportunity to welcome not one, but two guests here to the show because we are talking about another entry in the BSI Press manuscript series. In this case, we're talking about the Staunton tragedy, which looks at the manuscript of The Missing Three Quarter. And this time around, it's, it's a little different because we don't have the editor of this particular volume with us. We have two of the people who have made many of the ma manuscript series books possible. We have Phil Burgum and we have John Bergquist. Now, a little bit about each of them so you get to know them. Philip Burgum, BSI, works as a civil engineer with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. He became interested in Sherlock Holmes through the Jeremy Brett series, and his interest quickly expanded to Conan Doyle's other writings. He's become an authority on the life of Arthur Conan Doyle and enjoys conducting Sherlockian and Conan Doyle-related research. This volume, The Staunton Tragedy, marks the tenth book in the BSI manuscript series to which Phil has contributed. Phil, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here. Excellent. We also have 
John E. Bergquist, BSI, who's worked as a writer and editor in the corporate world and is co-publisher, along with Bob Katz, and production editor of the BSI Press. A proud holder of the BSI's Two Shilling Award, John has long been active in the Norwegian Explorers of Minnesota, having served as co-leader of its study group and as editor of its newsletter, Explorations, and also of its Christmas Annual. John serves on the board of the Friends of the Sherlock Holmes Collections at the University of Minnesota, his alma mater, and he's on the editorial board of its newsletter. John is also a member of the Speckled Band of Boston, the Sherlock Holmes Society of London, and other science societies. John, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you, Scott. Glad to be here. Well, this is going to be a real treat for us uh, because you two are um, a part of the engine behind the BSI press series, certainly the manuscript series, and we want to talk all about that. Before we do, let's get into the the origin story, not not of the two of you yet, but the origin story of your relationship with Sherlock Holmes. John, why don't you go first and tell us how you first met Sherlock Holmes. I first read the Red-Headed League. It was in an anthology of literature, I believe, in my freshman year in high school. And among other things that caught my fancy, that one did especially. And and I went to the school library and checked out, uh, I believe it was probably the Doubleday Omnibus Edition, read several more stories, and then sort of filed that in the back of my mind as something interesting, as, as uh, teenage years had more uh, exciting things in store for a while. So there, there were really two things about this time. I was um, just out of college and working in a, a book department of a department store in Minneapolis, and we had a table of what were called hurt books. These were well, some remainders and books that had been damaged, perhaps a torn dust cover or a bumped box or something. And there was this uh, box set called The Annotated Sherlock Holmes by William S. Baring Gould that had a slight tear in one of the two volumes, dust jacket and a slight bump in the corner. This was a $25 set, which was a lot of money to me at that time. And um, it was on sale at, at this Hurt Books table for $5. That, along with the Seven Good Nuts Solution, which I had just read in paperback, I think, all of a sudden opened up this wide world to me. And I, and I saw what, what was going on with the pseudo-scholarship, and it just really did something to me, as it has to so many of us. And like the the old story of the camel getting his nose in the tent and then the next neck of the camel is in the tent in the front part and finally the entire animal. Over the years, that happened to me from, from that starting point. By the way, I've recently gotten to know Nicholas Meyer a bit and, and told him about, if, if it weren't for you, I would not have been a Sri Lankan. I would have had all this time over the past few decades to, to do something else, kiddingly. But I, I thanked him for that. And he seemed sincerely appreciative that, that that was a big deal to me. That's superb. And, you know, there is such a rich history of uh, major Sherlockians in the Minnesota area. Um, you know, we, we talked, oh, I guess it was back on episode 185 or so, 185. We talked to uh, Julie McCurris and Tim Johnson about William Baring Gould. Uh, three names right there that are big in the Sherlockian circles. So uh, you, you you come from a land of uh, giant grown Sherlockians, John. Well, uh, Phil, why don't we move over to you and talk about your first meeting with Sherlock Holmes? The first attempt at getting me interested in Sherlock Holmes didn't take. Um, my dad's job had us living in Sweden. So I lived in Stockholm during third and fourth grade. Very fun upbringing. Um, and I discovered the school library there. But then eventually I kind of gravitated more towards probably books geared more towards my own age level. And I you know, started reading Encyclopedia Brown, uh, got into um, the Alfred Hitchcock Three Investigators series for kids. Um, and 
found science fiction and it was all downhill from there. Um, so, but living in Sweden, I remember somebody saying, oh, you like reading? Here, try this. And I read one of the Sherlock Holmes stories and it just it didn't take at that time. Fast forward a few years, my dad's job had us living in England. So I got to know how to speak British, which has come in good good stead for a lot of my uh, research. And my way around the English countryside, I have a valid British driver's license so I can, I can get back there and trip around. Um, but again, when I lived there, it wasn't during my four high school years, it wasn't interested in Sherlock Holmes. Um, it wasn't until seeing the Jeremy Brett series on PBS that I go, this is really good. I'd like to read a little bit about this. So I went to one of the bookstores and picked up a, a compendium and follow along in the book. And I realized that some of the best writing that was in the script was lifted directly from the pages as written by Arthur Conan Doyle. And it's, oh, I've got to try more of this stuff. Well, I'd already enjoyed exploring used bookstores so went to a few and i found the uh conan Doyle, the, the set the conan Doyle stories with a huge number of, of stories written by arthur conan Doyle, and i just loved them so i just started expanding uh my interest in arthur conan Doyle himself and then with that at the same time expanding on the the sherlock holmes set i think i was actually you know, more of a Doylean for a while. Uh, now it's probably equal parts, or, or maybe the Sherlock inside has taken over. But that's how I got into it. It was, it was later in life uh, through the Jeremy Brett series in the the mid to late eighties. Uh, but at one of the bookstores, I found uh, some pamphlets about this group called the Norwegian Explorers, and by happenstance, like John, I am also of Norwegian descent. Uh, but yeah, so it was in the early 90s that I joined up with the Norwegian Explorers, and and it's been a fun run ever since. I keep telling myself that when it stops being interesting, I'll stop doing it. But after, you know, 35 years, it's still interesting. That's superb. Well, when it comes to manuscripts, uh, the the BSI Press series is something the two of you have worked on for a long time, but that's not... That wasn't your first. I mean, you, you had some other experience before you came to Sherlock Holmes manuscripts, didn't you? We, we did. Phil and I actually collaborated on a the first annotated manuscript book that became the template for many of the BSI manuscript series books. It was The Horror of the Heights, a Conan Doyle science fiction story that happens to be the only complete <laughs> now, only complete fiction manuscript of the Doyle canon that you might say that we have in Minnesota. So that was the one that, that we did. Dick Sveum encouraged us. I should mention his name as well. Another great Sherlockian from Minnesota. And we uh, worked with um, uh, Christopher Arnold. Roden. Christopher Roden, thank you, Zilva. Christopher and Barbara Roden out in British Columbia to get that. Um, printed and published, they did a fine job with it. And that came to the attention, I think, of, of Mike Whalen, who uh, later, I guess my, my involvement first was approaching Les Klinger after the first couple BSI manuscript series volumes came out. There was, it was the one chapter of The Hound that was extant, and then the uh, Angels of Darkness drama that were published. And I picked those up right away and was sort of interested in that, having a publishing background. But I was a, a bit dismayed by the number of typos I found in those books, to be honest. And thought, I, I'm sure these are people doing this you know, on a volunteer basis and not a, lot of, not a lot of time to check for things. And perhaps I could help. And so I offered to do some proofreading. And I approached Les Klinger about that, and he took me up on it. And I did a, that for the next couple, including Mandate for Murder, which was the Red Circle manuscript, and the Napoleon bus business again, which Bill Hyder did on, on the Six Napoleons. And that, I guess, came to Mike Whalen's attention, and he then asked me to, if I would be willing to sort of be the focal point for the manuscript series and other BSI books, to coordinate things with uh, 
authors, editors, and to get the things printed and, and bound and whatever. And I said, I would be happy to do that. He said, what would you, what should we call you? And I thought for a second, said, I'm a production editor. And so I've worn that hat for the last 20 years or so now. And when, when, then shortly after that, Mike, uh, asked me to edit a book myself in the in the series, which was the manuscript of the three students held at, at Houghton Library in, in uh, Cambridge. And I thought, well, first of all, I'm going to ask two friends who I know would do a bang-up job of talking about the manuscript, one being Phil, since we had done the same thing before with The Horror of the Heights, and Randall Stock, a superb uh, researcher and uh, detail, most detail-oriented person I've ever met, who who gets f- finds what needs to be found and gets it down in print in a in a readable form. So I asked those two to collaborate on the uh, the, f- the first book that, that I edited, and right here it's called "The Pain- So Painful a Scandal" on the three students. And uh, Phil and I sort of worked out the basic structure of the manuscript page, re- reproduction of manuscript page on on the right hand of a of a of a spread with Phil's annotated manuscript on the left hand side of that. And we did it line by line. So a reader can actually see exactly if something is not clear in Conan Doyle's handwriting, which by the way, as we all know, is, was much more legible than many of ours would be, but certainly mine. But uh, a reader can follow around page by page, line by line and, and see what uh, Conan Doyle intended. And then with Phil's annotations, he'll point out where things have been crossed out, words have been changed. And then he, he goes way beyond that to, I should let Phil talk about this more in detail, but to, to collate this with all the different published versions of, of a particular story. And yeah, and like, this this oh, was oh, a oh, kind of a unique oh. element, I thought, in the BSI uh, manuscript series, because when we had seen some manuscripts before, either the early versions of, of the BSI uh, manuscripts, or even some that had been done overseas. I know the Priory School, the Lion's Main had been uh, done by some associations or groups before. You, you basically just had a digital scan of the manuscript, and if you couldn't read it, well, you were kind of out of luck. And so this page-by-page kind of translation um, into uh, into text and, and annotated text I thought was a real value add from the BSI press, and it allowed the reader to really delve down into some of these minutia of the manuscript that you might have maybe missed if it was just visual or couldn't have made out. Yeah, thank you. That was certainly an innovation that, that I thought would improve the concept of a, of a manuscript facsimile, and we've stuck with that ever since. Now, had had you seen that elsewhere before as someone who uh, worked in uh, uh, writing and, and publishing? Not really. I, I, I can recall talking with uh, Chris and Barbara Roden at a, an event when we were first talking about doing the, the uh, Horror of the Heights book. And I think among the three of us, we sort of came up with that concept. And then uh, Phil bought into that right away and, and uh, realized it. And we just have run since ever since. Can you add to that, Phil? Yeah, it, it, the idea just seemed to come upon us at the time as we were discussing it for the Horror of the Heights. Uh, it so happened that um, I picked up the two magazines that it appeared in and, and then as well as the books and just we had the idea of let's let's see how these compare with each other and where there were changes and there were some some discrete editorial changes in how the story is presented in the various publications early on and they were just fun to note out and then expanded on that when we started doing the the various uh, Sherlockian uh, stories uh, it's especially interesting 
doing the comparison with between the Strand and Colliers because there are times in which Colliers, when they get towards the end of the story and it's in the back bit kind of compressed up against advertising, sometimes they, they, the layout people would figure out that they're going to be running out of space. So they'd cut out lines here, or paragraphs here. Uh, so it's very interesting that, that you know, if, if you're going to read it, if that was the first time that you're reading something, there are bits and pieces that are missing. And it was just fascinating to be able to dig into it that deep uh, to find out where these missing bits are. And there are actually some times uh, that we found that the Collier's is more, or actually many times, the Collier's version is more true to the original manuscript because the Strand magazine, Conan Doyle, he could get the proof version from the Strand and he'd make changes that would occur in the Strand but wouldn't appear in the Collier's version. So just, again, seeing these these changes has just been thrilling uh, to be a part of and and taking that and putting it into the print so that other people can see that and there's enough of us crazy Sherlockians out there that uh, hopefully a few other people are thrilled about it too I've told Phil sometimes that he might have an audience of three or four people worldwide but some people will think this is really cool <laughs> <laughs> yep. I, I should say Phil mentioned of course comparing the brand and Collier's he went way beyond that as well. There were newspaper syndicates that, that uh, published these books, or the, the, the short stories. There were book anthologies, John Murray in the U.K., and Doubleday in, in the U.S., and others. There, McClure was involved. In, and as you, anyone who's read one of these last 10 manuscript series books will see, Phil collates all of them, the, the different versions pointing out if somebody used an A rather than an AND, for example, and, and in the St. Louis Dispatch. It's just an amazing minutia that he, I, I'm often awed by his um, persistence in finding out all these the little discrepancies. It's a gentle madness. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Ah. Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? Well, that's exactly what the Wes Express has done. Built a time machine in style to take you back to 1986 and the first issues of the Sherlock Holmes Review. Groundbreaking interviews with Jeremy Brett and Peter Cushing. Rare reprints from the Strand Magazine like A Day with Dr. Conan Doyle, and a profile of William Gillette as Sherlock Holmes. All four issues of Volume 1, almost impossible to find today, can be yours, reprinted in a handsome 7x10 volume. Take a trip back to the Sherlockian fever of the 1980s. With the Sherlock Holmes Review Anthology, Volume 1, available right now at wessexpress.com. Phil, one of the things that you wrote about in your essay in The Staunton Tragedy is about rugby. And I'm curious, when you look at the other editions, the other reprints, the other appearances of The Missing Three Quarter, particularly in America, were there any instances you came across where um, you know, that sort of affected the way the story appeared, because, of course, it's appearing before an audience of Americans that might not be familiar with rugby. No, there is no indication that, that rugby was talked about or, or presumed that people would know how it worked. And I really wonder if if that led to the how well it was received by American audiences. Um, the missing three quarter, it's, it's not one of the better liked stories um it as a matter of fact it ranks really close to the bottom among the various lists that are out there uh you know it doesn't matter uh, even the worst of the sherlockian stuff is better than just about anything else out there um but i i do truly wonder if some of the reason for the poor reception at least in america is because of a lack of understanding of the game of rugby 
Well, that's a possibility, too. And then Peter Blau, you know, one of the other things we've got, of course, in the Snowden tragedy is a lovely series of essays. And I want to come back, Phil, to your essay, too. But another essay is about by Peter Blau about the dramatizations of the missing three quarter. And so you would expect for a story that's sort of at the bottom of the list of the great tales of Sherlock Holmes, there wouldn't be too many times that it was dramatized. And in fact, that's the case. But I think Peter in that essay quotes Bert Cools as saying, you know, if the BBC hadn't committed to do the entire canon for the radio, we probably would never have done the missing three quarter because I think he said, it's not really a mystery and it has sort of a tragic ending with no uh, firm conclusion. But despite that, I found some really fascinating elements of this, which I'm sure we'll go into a little bit later when we start talking, or I can talk about it right now. Sure, let's go. Okay, excellent. Um, So usually I've got my annotations, and then more often than not, I'm also allowed to write an essay that I talk about some of the things that I found in this. And some of the things that I found for the annotations, um, just with rugby, um, I delved into the history of it, and it was it turned out to be very fascinating. And again, I presented this for the the readers out there because when this is written, um, you know, rugby was still changing. They're they're developing. Or there are groups who were spinning off. Uh, one group wanted to be more. Professional, the, the teams that were playing mostly at the time were all amateur, but there were some that kind of wanted, people wanted to get paid for it, so that was a spin off group. Um, they're changing how the points were scoring. So there was a, a, a variation or a development of rugby as Doyle was writing this. A um, couple other things um, that I did find in there uh, there's mention about Pompeii the dog's name and you know it was from a a, a russian general sorry sorry a a roman general um but also the football club soccer for us americans but the football club in portsmouth were known as the the pompey uh keepers Uh, now doyle he played for an earlier version of that same club, but I wonder, and I mentioned in there, if, if Doyle kind of gave a nod to you know, what became of his former football club by using the name Pompey for the, the dog. Um, and speaking of the dog, so he was a drag hound. Explain a little bit about that. Uh, it's kind of like fox hunting without the fox, a much, much more gentle one, where you drag a bag of aniseed and you've got dogs that are trained to follow that as a scent. Well, that was actually being done in Cambridge and Oxford in the 19th century, I found. So it makes sense that Holmes would have been able to find a drag hound in Cambridge because they had teams for this. It was it was a sport that people liked playing. And like I say, the Foxes liked it because they didn't get killed at the end of it. Um Another thing that I find amazing about Doyle's writing is that he put enough detail in there that we can have fun digging into it. Um, if he made everything up, we wouldn't be doing the stuff that we do. We wouldn't be digging deep. And I've also thought that if he had it absolutely perfect, it'd be too boring that we wouldn't bother doing all the digging in. But instead, what we're able to is we can we can look into train schedules and figure out where he got things maybe off a little bit. Um, he talks about the moon phase and, well, okay, that helps us line up a date. Uh, people have figured out tide schedules, uh, streets, hotels, and the subject of hotels. I was able to uh, look in the story and in the story they they talk about where the rugby team was staying in a private hotel in London to be able to play the game. Uh, and it was close to, um, effectively close to Trafalgar Square. Um, it so happens that Craven Street, which is where there are a lot of private hotels, is my favorite uh, for being a possibility where this unnamed hotel, or it, it was named, but it, it's not a, a true name. It happens to be one street over from where the... Sherlock Holmes pub is 
And so it's just fun to see that in context with the other things that were out there. Um, so a lot of this stuff comes up in, in the annotations, in the, the essay. As you mentioned, I did uh, talk about the history and details of rugby, talking about a bit of the history and explaining the point scoring system, especially as it applied at the time, uh, to help get a little bit more interest of uh, we American writers, our readers. And then also the other fun thing that I loved doing, and it was exciting in this, the telegram plays such an important part of this this story. Uh, So I researched that, found a lot of fascinating contemporary sources um, on Google Books and other sources out there of you know, how a telegram was sent. What did you have to do to write it? I, people at the time, they would know this in the same way that we know how to send an email. But nowadays, we don't know how to do it. So it's fun to be able to write about that and, and the possibility of, of, of the telegram. Yeah, um, now, it, it's it's great that you point out that about the telegram too. But this this is worth, you know, underscoring for the listeners because, you know, when somebody tells you we've reprinted a manuscript and now you can see where the ands were changed and this was rewritten, you know, that's one thing. But really, in the annotations, you have a whole window into the life and psychology of the time and of the writer. And there are lots of interesting things to discover that really add. And one of the things you've got in your essay is a list of things where elements of the plot seem to relate to Conan Doyle's life. But also the telegram is really central to the missing three quarter because if our listeners don't remember or know, the missing three quarter has a scene in it in which Holmes needs to discover what telegram was sent to who at a particular time. And he knows where the telegram office is and he makes this cryptic remark, you know, oh, uh, he, after he successfully determines something about the telegram by a visit to the office, he makes this cryptic remark. Well, I had six other ruses for extracting that information, which we will, <laughs> like many of his offhanded remarks, we will never learn precisely what those what those were. But there's a lot of that that goes on. In particular, I I was always struck when I first read this story about the counterfoil. So what is a telegram as an example, Phil? What's a telegram counterfoil? That's one that I actually could not find. I mean, I spent an inordinate amount of time trying to figure find the word counterfoil as it fit with um, uh, in relationship to telegrams. And Google, books, no place could I find counterfoil. It was referenced in, in context with uh, check, check blanks and a, a receipt of, of that, but not not in particular. So I was, it was a, a frustrating failure on my part, not being able to come up with that. But uh, I figure it was just probably the, the top copy that was written there, but I did not find that word used in any of the contemporary uh, writings about that. Yes, and if, if I may carry on a little bit, you, you mentioned uh, you know, the, the six other ruses that he, or attempts that he could have done. That was another great essay that was in, in the book, too, that was uh, just fun, the, the different things that people will choose to, to build upon. Yes, and that's that's Marino Alvarez's essay, mm-hmm. I guess, where he pointed out there are 31 stories of Sherlock Holmes, 31 cases where telegrams appear, and that by his by his tracking, Holmes himself sent 28 telegrams. So, just one of the many facts you'll acquire. <laughs> from carefully studying and reading the Staunton tragedy. Yeah. And uh, you know, I I have to say of of and and maybe it's this is because it's just the most recent in my mind, but as I look through uh the table of contents and look at all of the the chapters in this particular uh BSI press manuscript book, this grouping of essays to me seems to be one of the most varied of all of them. Uh, you know, there, as, as, um, unappealing <laughs> as this story is, there are really so many elements about it that, uh, indicate, uh, some level of interest or, um, alternative theory or, uh, associated hobby or something that we can pursue. So it's really a story that is rich in so many subtexts and, and sub elements that, um, it, it, its value almost comes from what we get from it rather than just the story itself. 
That's very really true. So as as you look across this set of essays, and we do this to everyone, and they all demure the same way, um, do you, each of you, have um, a particular favorite essay for whatever reason? I know you're going to say, oh, we love all of our children, but is there any essay that <laughs> stood out to you for any particular reason? Um, I, I could say that the, the closing essay by Don Dvorsky tries to sort of upend the, the whole <laughs> uh, theory of, of what was what actually happened to the, the poor victim in the missing three quarter, and he came up with quite a quite a startling uh, alternative explanation of that. I won't go into that and spoil it for anyone who's not yet read the book. You have to read the book, which is available on the BSI website. As a matter of fact, BakerStreetIrregulars dot com to uh, find out Don's theory on on the demise of poor Mrs. Staunton. Uh, Vern mentioned the Marino Alvarez's article about the use of telegram in the home stories. And Lou Lewis also goes into the speculation of what six, those six alternative ruses may have been. Holmes was uh, hit on the one right away, and, and I hope he didn't get the poor telegraph operator fired for this, but, but she did leave up this information. But Lou goes through other home stories where Holmes had used disguise or other types of subterfuge to get information out of people. My favorite being, I think, uh, Breckenridge and the Blue Carbuckle, when this man was very close-mouthed about not wanting to say where he got his geese. And Holmes realized he was a betting man and said, oh, man, you're, you're going to lose your bet in this one bet, one bet, and then I'll, and he was off to the races and got the information he wanted. So that, that's a clever one as well. Um, as you say, Scott, it's hard to say what your children to you want a favor, but they're they're all good. Um, Mike Whalen, who had the concept for this book, first wanted every contributor to be. 75 years or older in age, members of the sort of informal missing three-quarters society, three-quarters of a century in 75 years. But he, he made exceptions for, um, uh, well, certainly for Phil and for Randall, who are, have not yet reached that age, and also Mike McSwiggan, who's done some really good work in chronology lately, and he did an excellent job in this one. And uh, Mike Homer, I, I don't think, also is 75 on uh, legal aspects of this. But other, otherwise, there are some venerable names here among the contributors. Uh, Bill, to Bill Dorn from Colorado, uh, Lou Lewis, we mentioned. Don Isbin, who wrote a little pastiche. <laughs> we probably had sort of an informal um, policy in these books to not include pastiches. We made an exception for Don Isbin, and it fit in quite well. And he also does a lex lexicon of re rugby terms. So between Don's and Phil's, the American reader can get a nice little education on the basis, basic, uh, the basic aspects of rugby. We have Hartley Nathan, uh, Bruce Parker. So some uh, ge gentlemen a little bit along in their years who are still sharp Sherlockians, and it's, it's fine to feature them. Um, I hadn't thought, Scott, as you pointed out, about the, the variety of the types of topics here, but because perhaps because the story is a bit thin, as has been mentioned, and it's not among anyone's list of the best Sherlock Holmes stories, nonetheless, it, it's a good example of what can be done by Sherlockians without much fodder to work with. Uh, Holmes says, I, I need clay to make my bricks. Well, there wasn't a whole lot of clay here, but we came up with some pretty decent bricks. Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. And well, hey, this is this is how Bert and I have gotten up to 230 episodes on trifles on our other podcast. Uh, we, we don't seem to be running out of material. And Phil, you mentioned this uh, early on 35 years in the hobby and you still find interesting things. I think that's uh, bound to continue. Yes. Now, uh, one thing that really stood out to me with uh, with regard to this manuscript was it's. 
its origin in a collection. Uh, typically, we will find these manuscripts either in a private collection, uh, perhaps in uh, one of the major Sherlockian library collections. Um, in this case, I think we had to go to the British Museum, and there's a, a wonderful page in, in calligraphic form that is included with the manuscript that reads, Presented to the British People, on the occasion of the centennial anniversary of the birth of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, May 22nd, 1859. And then it's signed, uh, 1959, uh, and under the column the United States, there's J. Bliss Austin, Lou David Feldman, E.T. Goyman Jr., Rollin V. N. Hadley Jr., and Edgar W. Smith. And then in the facing column, Great Britain, Sherlock Holmes Society of London, and Friends of the National Libraries. What can you tell us about this wonderful uh, origin story about this manuscript making its way to the British Museum? Certainly. Well, Randall Stock's essay goes into quite detail about that. The manuscript had several owners over the, the years, um, Lou David Feldman being a, a dealer who handled it, and Rollin Hadley was owner at the time. I, th I think Randall makes the point that it was probably Hadley's idea to for a c collaboration of the Baker Street Irregulars and the Sherlock Holmes Society of London to purchase the manuscript and present it to the library on the anniversary of Conan Doyle's 100th birth. And that's what was done with some of those august names there, including Edward Smith and and uh, T.S. Blakeney from the British side was involved, who were one of the very earliest writings on the right of British at the test of time. Um, and they had this Dynanized calligraphy, as you mentioned, and it was presented in 1959 to the British Library, where it still resides. And luckily they were uh, very forthcoming in having the manuscript scanned in a high-resolution form and letting us um, publish it, but charging only the basic cost of the, of the scanning itself, no royalties or anything. So we've been very fortunate that way. I should just mention in general in the manuscript series, uh, we found such great cooperation from other institutions that hold them in. We're so lucky to have our own two um, irregulars, Glenn Moranker and Costa Rosakis, own, who own between the two of them, several manuscripts, and have been as generous as could be in, in letting us publish them and having them scanned for our, for our use. It's it's a great story, and I like Randall's essay tremendously about that because he does make it very clear. But the lovely thing is these five Americans, you know, Bliss Austin, Lou David Feldman, Roland Headley, Edgar Smith, so on. Um, you know, this was a non-trivial thing. Each one of them probably came up with about $250, which is a lot of money in 1959, uh, to make this purchase possible and to make the presentation possible. So it was sort of a significant personal commitment by them. But I was um, interested in that on one side of the page, as Scott pointed out, it says the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. It would have been nice, although it's great to see these names there, but it would have been nice on the other side of the page to see the Baker Street Irregulars. Uh, a wider group, even beyond the five Americans, than uh, than the list of the five that are there. But it was a it's a, a significant gesture for the British people at a wonderful time, as you point out, the centennial of Conan Doyle's birth. Indeed, that would have been nice. I, I believe, as you said, Bert, those five did contribute out of their own pockets, each two hundred fifty dollars. Uh, Hadley's contribution being the manuscript itself. Yeah. Amazing. Well, and then we have the, the contribution of the two of you to this wonderful uh, volume and the whole series uh, to, to thank for, uh, for it. What else are you working on right now? What, what can you tell us about what's coming up next in the manuscript series that we can uh, look forward to? Well, funny you should ask, because the editor of the upcoming volume is sitting with us at Brigham, and this will be the manuscript of, of the um, 
Well, Phil, go ahead. Well, tell us what you've been doing so far on that on the next project. Well, actually, the the first one that's going to be coming up this upcoming January, uh, that one's. Oh, that's true. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm skipping ahead. Yeah, those of us who work on these, we kind of get. Uh, Forget where exactly we are between exactly. working, printing, and, and it's been uh, available for sale. Exactly. It's not in tragedy. We, we worked on it for a year year past, so I sort of had to re- refresh my memory on that. And the one that Phil will be working on is will be upcoming, we, and we'll let him talk about that. But the most current one that will be ready in January is the um, manuscript facsimile of the Norwood Builder, and that is edited by Ross Davies. That's in production right now. I just finished my part of it about a month ago, and, and we're doing a little polishing, and then it's off to our friends at Wessex Press, one of your sponsors, who do the uh, dust jackets and covers for our manuscript series and other other books as well. And that's a fascinating one as well. There's some, uh, Ross did a great job organizing the material and uh, presenting it. And when people hand things off to me, um, my level of work and involvement varies a lot depending on how much is done previously. And, and Ross handed off a very, very clean set of documents for me to work with. So I, my hat's off to Ross for that. And uh, you'll... Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy this book when it does come out. But I, I should say, in, in Phil's uh, articles in these books, he often comes up with a little clever uh, title for for his. For example, the Staunton tragedy is tackling the missing three quarter, and in the in Norwood Builder, he is smoking out the Norwood Builder is the title of his essay. I'll forward to that. Well, it it sounds like Bert, you you have a uh, kindred spirit there. Good, good. We need all yes. we can get. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but then the one that will be coming up for release in January of 2023, good heavens, that's a ways, it seems like it's a ways out, but it'll be here sooner than we can imagine, um, is going to be The Adventure of the Retired Colorman, uh, which you know, one, one of the last ones written or appearing and uh, have just in the early stages of of getting that one set up, uh, talked to a bunch of people, including a few who have never been involved in uh, the manuscript series before. Uh, some of some people who have been, some people who haven't. Uh, but it, I think that we've picked a, a good set of essays to write about uh, when. As first task to come up with some ideas, I, it was hard. It was very difficult to do that. I, I felt uh, like I had splinters in some of the ideas from scraping the bottom of the barrel. But then uh, between uh, John and, and Bob Katz uh, and, uh, and others, they came up with a lot of really good suggestions that, again, they had so many that I wound up having to winnow them, winnow them down a little bit and then reaching out to people uh, to come up with, uh, with with authors for these. Um, so we're, we're off and uh, s- slowly starting to work on things. Excellent. Well, we will look forward to uh, both of those, uh, as well as other publications from the BSI Press, coming up in uh, the next successive Januaries. Um, well, if you would like to get a copy of uh, the Staunton Tragedy, just go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com. There you can find it in uh, one of the most uh, uh, the most recent publications. I should say the uh, the dust jacket design is is another wonderful job. Uh, it is uh, it, it's a couple of stills or a still, I should say, from uh, the Island Norwood uh, series, one, one of the silent films. Uh, which, of course, placed Holmes in modern times at the time, would have been in the 1920s or so. Really nice job done there. And then when you take the dust jacket off uh, in in gilt lettering in Conan Doyle's own handwriting on the cover of the book is the phrase, A woman, young and beautiful, was lying dead upon the bed. Uh Uh-oh. I should have said spoiler alert. Well... (laughs) Phil, John, it is no spoiler having the two of you with us. Thank you so much for joining us here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. 
It's been a great pleasure to be part of this. You're very welcome. Thanks for thanks for asking. I love that conversation, and it's a terrific book. And one of the things I like about the conversation is we went through the authors and the papers. One we didn't mention was John Linsenmeyer. John Linsenmeyer is an esteemed, longstanding, irregular who's written a wonderful essay in the book comparing Dr. Leslie Armstrong, who's one of these people who is opposed to Sherlock Holmes and indeed seems at one point in the case to be very Moriarty-like. And John, in his essay, compares Dr. Leslie Armstrong with Moriarty. And that is really interesting. But one of the things John says in his essay is, you know, I think this comparison is very unfair to Dr. Leslie Armstrong, who, after all, is a renowned educator, while Professor Moriarty is just a sacked academic reduced to a role as an army crammer. (laughs) <laughs> and and I, I love that and the book really is a lot of fun so it was great to talk to them about that really was and, and uh, th- this collaboration has been going on for so long and again they are uh, a couple of the, the guys that are behind the scenes on this so it's really nice to hear their perspective on what goes into making something as um, as interesting and as exciting as this Have you noticed that the direct-to-consumer market has made it easier than ever to get items you love delivered to you on a regular basis? It could be a monthly subscription to a newspaper, laundry detergent, or razor blades, and you can depend on getting what you need without fail every month. Well, what if you could do the same thing with Sherlock Holmes books? That's exactly what MX Publishing has introduced, the Sherlock Holmes Book Club. With their monthly subscription, you'll be able to get a regular delivery of volumes from the MX Book of New Sherlock Holmes Stories. Fans can choose from a monthly subscription or a full year up front for a small discount. If you're planning on reading any of the new Sherlock Holmes stories from MX Publishing, this is an affordable and reliable way to get your fix. Just go to iHose.co slash MX Book Club and sign up today. That's all lowercase, iHose.co slash MX Book Club. Try it this month. Ah, you know what that music means. That's right, it's time for everyone's favorite Sherlockian quiz show. That's right, it's Canonical Couplets, where we give you two lines of poetry, and you are supposed to infer what the heck it is we're talking about. Well, if you remember from these parts the last time around, We gave you this clue. Mrs. Warren's lodger paid her well, five pounds a week, to pierce the lodger's mystery in a mirror Holmes would peek. Bert, (laughs) do you know which story we were referring to? Yeah, of course I do. That's the story of the eccentric bedspread designer who supposedly leaves money to his relatives in Britain. That's the story they called The Three Garish Beds. Okay. Okay. Um, (laughs) If you say so. (laughs) Um, It was great. It was really wonderful. It was sort of a starchy story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good try. It's a good try. And, and of course, our pal Eric Deckers did not let oh. us down. He, he sent oh, in an no. entry. He said, Mrs. Warren's lodger turned out to be a Chicago newspaper columnist who interviewed regular normal people about their lives. It's the adventure of Studs Terkel. <laughs> ah, wait, he says, I tell a lie. It's the adventure of the Red Circle. Yes, that is exactly it, Eric. That's what we were looking for, the adventure of the Red Circle. 
Well, we had uh, a scads. Uh, we had scads of people who uh, gave an entry this time around. So we're going to do the usual and bring out the big prize wheel and give it a big spin. And it goes around and around, eventually settling on number. 48, number 48, and that corresponds to Tony Shar. <laughs> Tony, congratulations. We have a copy of The Quest for Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, 13 Biographers in Search of a Life, one of John Lellenberg's books. That'll be going out to you as the quiz prize. Well, of course, we have another prize this time around, and in this case, it's a set of books. It is people who are interested in this show may be interested in these books. We've got the Sherlock Holmes Crossword Puzzle Book 2, the Sherlock Holmes Puzzle Book, and the Final Problems, Sherlock Holmes Mystery Trivia. For all of you trivia-minded people, these uh, fine gifts were uh, sent to us courtesy of Tony Katroki. Tony, thank you very much for contributing to the IHOS vaults. And if you would like a shot at these particular items, then all you have to do is answer this canonical couplet. Watson rushed to Mary, said, I'm off to Birmingham. And downstairs in a cab, he met a Cockney city man. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, drop it in an email addressed to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all of the correct answers and we choose you at random, you will win. Good luck. All right. Well, One of the things that we should do is update our listeners on the great outcome of one of our prizes are special events associated with the last episode where you had a very special eBay auction uh, mounted for a little while that got a very um, enthusiastic uh, set of responses, I think. It did. We had uh, an extra copy of the Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual from 1998, uh, it was written by John Lallenberg. It was the first Christmas annual in 38 years, and it kicked off the last, uh, wow, gosh, 30 or 30 plus years of, uh, Christmas annuals that we've been experiencing. Actually, it would, be, it would be 23 Christmas annuals or so that we've been experiencing. Um, it went, went up for auction on eBay and finally, uh, settled just a couple of days ago, um, for nearly $300. People were really, really excited about that. And uh, we, we brought in some funds for uh, what we do around here. So really appreciate uh, the avid bidding and um, congratulations to the bidder. I, I won't give away who it was because, well, you know how eBay works. Uh, if that person would like to raise a hand and identify uh, themselves, they can do that. Well, you, you said last time that it was going to go to the Watson Fund. The Watson Fund, right. And now you've just said it's well, going to go to us, basically. Well, well, one of those. We'll figure out what we do with it. Um, I, I was thinking of uh, taking you out for a nice dinner, Bert. Well, I'm ready to go. Uh, <laughs> I'll be there in a minute. The Watson Fund. Maybe the BSI Trust. Maybe, maybe that's yeah, what we you should would, put you, you had mentioned. You had mentioned, I think, last time, either the BSI Trust or the Watson Fund. Perfect. Perfect. It, it will go to some worthy charity. Not that, Bert, you're not a worthy charity, but, you know. Well, I keep sending, for 17 years, I've sent you invoices, and none of them have been paid. I've just given up. <laughs> given up. One of these days. One of these days, Alice. Pow! Zoom. Well, until that day comes, I remain the zoomed-in Scott Monty. And I'm the completely in perspective, and look at that proscenium, Bert Wolder. Ha! Huh. And together... We say the, the game's afoot. <laughs> the, the game's afoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. 
Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.